Okay, so it's nice to see you again. I mean, I think most of you have already taken 109 and 1010 from me, maybe just two of you. Okay, so, okay, just first announcement today. The Nobel Prizes have been announced for 2016, and this year they have been given to theoretical physicists, theoretical condensed matter physicists, these three guys, and they have been working on topological phases of matter. Now, what does a topological phase of matter mean? Uh, we will try to arrange a seminar on this subject, either in the class, if we cannot arrange it as a department, or, I mean, if we can arrange it, it will be a department seminar. There, hopefully, you will be able to learn more on this topic. So this year, we will be doing electromagnetic theory for some boring stuff. For those of you who haven't taken any courses from me, well, these, these are my contact, my short information on me. And what we'll, we will be covering, if you had logged into the class, this information is already available over here, the, the book. Uh, we will be covering the uh, Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics. And the topics we will be covering will be, uh, this week we will be spending some time on uh, reviewing vector analysis, what are vectors, how do we manipulate them, uh, what are gradient, curl, uh, and the divergence of a vector, a scalar, et cetera. I mean, these are probably topics that you, sh you had covered in 2009 or 2010. But I mean, it will be kind of a fast review. If there is something that's not clear, you can just ask this week. I mean, we will be using them throughout the semester. And then we will start with electrostatics. This semester, I mean, if you, you are, this is the first time that this course is offered. Before, if you know, it was just a single semester course, electrodynamics. And it was supposed to cover both electrostatics and electrodynamics, but uh, since in practice, one semester was only enough to cover elect electrostatics and magnetostatics, not the dynamics. So we, the department decided to split this course, so we will be having two courses, the electromagnetic uh, theory one this semester, which will be devoted to the static properties of charges. And next semester, we will be having electromagnetic theory two, which will be devoted to the dynamical properties of charges. We will start with electrostatics and then some uh, mathematical methods. Again, most of these, uh, well, the Laplace equation you should have uh, seen in last year, the separation of variables you should have seen <coughs> last year. But nevertheless, for us, they will be important, so we will be uh, just reviewing them. Um, if you don't remember what you had seen in 2009 or 2010, I strongly advise you to review it on your own also. Then the, uh, we just start with electrostatics. We put charges, stationary charges in matter. And then we will start with charges moving with constant through currents, through static currents, and then put currents in matter, uh, how the properties of the current, the, the current changes, the fields change, and then Towards the end of the semester, we will just write the Maxwell's equations and we will make an introduction to electrodynamics. And from there, we will pick up next semester and just see the consequences of, of these electrodynamics. We will be studying the electromagnetic wave, their, inter their refraction, their uh, properties in matter, etc. Now, some <coughs> suggested reading. <coughs> Now, if you look at these topics, and uh, if you remember uh, what we have covered in 110, General Physics 2, you will see that the topics are identical. I mean, we will not be covering any new subject material this semester, but what we will, we will be doing is that we will just take the material of General Physics 2, the second semester, first year course, and then add some mathematics to it. And if you remember, in the first year, we were just looking at simple systems a straight line charge, a circular charge, etc. This semester we will be just dealing, dealing with more general systems. So more complicated configurations of charges and currents, etc. And we will see how to uh, study such systems. So I do recommend your general physics book because one drawback of this semester's course will be we will be dealing with lots of mathematics. So you shouldn't get lost in the mathematics and forget about the physics. 
The first year freshman books, they are great in the sense that they, oh, they can, since they cannot use mini mathematics, they just concentrate on the physics, what's going on, the physical phenomena. So they, they will be a great source for you if you feel that you are lost in mathematics and you just cannot understand what's going on. Just pick up a <coughs> freshman book and they will be a great source. Of course, the Feynman lectures, the second volume is devoted to electromagnetism. There are many open courseware uh, pages that you can go and there's the MIT, there is the Turkish Science Association, there is the METI also has an open courseware uh, page where you can find videos, lecture notes, and many materials about the lectures. Well, there are four or five books listed in Opto class. And of course, you can just pick up any other book in the library if you don't like the Griffith. There are many books in the library. I mean, I don't recommend you to search for books on the web. I mean, first go to the library. If you find the book, then search it on the web. But because the good thing about going into the library and searching in the library is you have to go through many books. And while you are going through many books, you just learn a lot of things. At least you know uh, which book to pick up when you are looking for a subject. You see the titles of various different subjects that you were not aware of. So that is the nice thing about going to the library. On the, on the web, most of the time, you just uh, search for a particular book, you find it, and that's it. Okay, grading. Okay, that you will, we will have two midterms, one final, and of course you will be having homework more or less once every week, except on the exam dates. Now the exams will be, uh, well, I forgot to update here. If you don't oppose it, one will be in November 17, I think. The other one will be December 24. I had added them to my slides, but for some reason it didn't appear in the PDF. I, I will be putting these slides on Otto class this today, and then you can check the dates there. You can also see the midterm dates on the Otto class. I have already assigned the midterms for the week. I mean, the midterm will be the, f the Saturday of that week. There will be one makeup after the final. I mean, you can, if you had some medical report or for some reason you didn't feel like taking the exam and told me that you didn't want to take the exam, then you can take this makeup. Or if for some reason it might be that during one of the exams you, it was not your day and you got a really low grade but your other two exams are, you had a high grades, then you can take the, make, the makeup exam. So just make sure that if you have a medical report, keep the original, I mean, don't give it to me, I will lose it, uh, but send me an email of the photograph so that I can keep track of who will be taking the makeup exam. Okay, for those of you who had taken the general physics from me, you are familiar with the pre-report. <coughs> well, this year, we are third year students at least, so I will not be forcing the pre-reports on you. There will still be pre-reports. What I mean by pre-reports is you should come to the class already having an idea of what we will be covering. So if you look at the class, there are the titles. Those are the topics that we will be covering every week. Well, those are the titles of the sections in the book. So you already know every week what we will be covering more or less. Uh, so just the, until the weekend before, until the first lecture, please read it, read those relevant sections so you will have an idea. So you will basically form the skeleton of what we will be discussing over here and then when you are listening you can just fill the gaps and ask your questions. And if for some reason you don't feel like asking questions in the class, etc., you can prepare these prayer reports which are supposed to be more or less one page 300 words. Half of it is what you understand, half of it is your questions, and if you just upload them on time, it will be last Sunday of the week. And <coughs> if you upload them, I will read them, and if uh, several of you have the same questions, I will spend more time on it. So it, it will also guide me in the lecture. You don't have to do it, it's not obligatory. But nevertheless, I mean, I do strongly advise you to do it. And at the end of the semester, I mean, there's always the grading time. 
and a regretful time for the lecturers and the students. And well, if you want, I mean, it happens that you just lose a half a letter grade with, I don't know, one point, etc. I will see what I can do if I know that you had done during the semester, what you could have done. One of them is this one. So if you didn't do pre reports, you didn't do homework, etc. I mean, there is a very little chance that I will be flexible, let's say. Okay, this is a, just a, some of the entries in a list, the list, if you just click it over here, you will see the list. Okay, you are third year students and you should have already learned that you should come in class on time. And if you skip classes, I'm not taking attendance, so <coughs> there won't be any consequences like I, I won't automatically give you a failing grade, etc. But there will of course be consequences in the exams. And we are not happy to read your homework. It's extra work for us, but I will still give you homework because I, believe, I strongly believe that that is the best way that you can learn. If you complain about there are too many homeworks, believe me, we are also complaining about that we have to read so many pay homework papers. Okay, so <laughs> ethics, don't cheat, this full page. Okay, attendance. I'm not taking the attendance as I said, <coughs> but there are of course drawbacks. I mean, it's, I mean, I have, this is one of the critical things that I have been, this, been thinking about, whether should I take attendance or not. I am against taking attendance. In the first year, if you remember, uh, for those who took the first year courses from me, I didn't take attendance, but I did pop quizzes instead, which was kind of a way of taking attendance. My experience, my first year experience in METU was that I thought, okay, you're a university student, you should decide on your own whether you want to attend or not. So there were like 15 students registered in my first year class, and we did lectures with two of them throughout the semester. The other ones never showed up. Of course, they showed up at the end of the semester when it was grading time. <coughs> that was kind of too late. If you don't attend, you fail, more or less. I mean, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's my impression. Of course, for one student, it might not work. For the other, it might not work. But for the majority, I believe that it does work, this correlation. If I if take attendance, then it's my responsibility to follow you, that you chase after you, let's say, that uh, you are attending the class. But you should be able to take, in that case, you don't learn to take responsibility for your own actions. If I don't take attendance, well, I'm afraid uh, usually 20, 30 percent of the students, they just disappear until the exam time or the midterm time. And well, you fail. So do attend, although I'm not following you, I will not be chasing you. I mean, it's for your good if you attend the lecture. And by attending, I don't mean just, just coming in the class and sitting in the back. Do participate in the class. I mean, this year, at least, you are lucky that there will be less than 30 students taking this course because it's the first time and only the students who have not failed before and most of you who didn't fail any of your previous courses before. So, I mean, your friends probably, they couldn't take this course because they failed some other course. Next year, they will be taking this course, so I'm expecting the class to be more cowed, but this year, we are not cowed. So it's just a, around less than 30 students. So it's a great opportunity for you to interact, to be active in the class. And just one remark, one uh, point to pay attention to. You will be sending me emails. And quite often you forget to add your name to your email. So the only thing I see is your student ID and I am just lazy to look up your names and I just answer your email. And in your questions, you just tell me that you are, your, you are my student in the electromagnetic theory course. Well, I'm teaching two electromagnetic theory courses this year. One of them is electromagnetic theory one, the other one is electromagnetic theory only. The old course is the section two. So if you send me an email, please make sure that you use the course code so I will know which lecture you are talking about. And sometimes it just happens that I'm just too busy I, <coughs> to concentrate on something or too tired when I'm writing your email. 
I just failed to make connection with your name and the course code. I might be replying for the other course. So I just don't forget to mention the course code when you are writing me your email. Questions? Okay, there is one more point I had forgotten. Uh, the lecture hours, uh, we have lectures, and if you look at the, <coughs> the schedule, the course program, we have lectures on Tuesday, on Wednesday, at, Tuesday at this hour, on Wednesday at 8.40, and on Friday at 12.40, right? Now, four of these hours I will be using as lecture hours. The, my intention is to use the Tuesday hour and the Friday hour for lectures. Wednesday hours will be for recitation at 8.40. Now, <clears throat> the problem with the recitation hours is uh, there are a couple of issues. I am a strong supporter that there should be recitations for every course, especially for every must course. And the recitations should be done by an assistant, not by the lecturer. Now, my reasoning is that you tend to only interact with your lecturers, not with the assistants or other professors. So you should be interacting with all the professors, anybody in the department, you should be able to interact with them. Furthermore, I mean, students usually uh, get too used to just going to uh, the lecturer or the professor and asking them students and getting the answer right away. So that kind of makes you, uh, makes a habit of, I mean, you get used to having easy answers. But in your future life, you'll never have easy answers. So you will have to discuss with people who are more or less has the same knowledge as you do, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. And you should be able to judge whether their answers are correct or not. I mean, when I, when I say something, most of the students, they just accept it as fact, even if it's wrong. So you should also be <coughs> used to judging whether an answer is correct or not on your own. And if nobody knows an answer to a question, you should, be, you should get used to just looking for the answer with you know, the assistants, et cetera. But what happens is when the, uh, there is an assistant teaching the, doing the recitation hours, the students don't show up. So I will be doing the recitation hours. Uh, it's on Wednesday, 8.40. Well, 8.40 hours is also quite often the students don't show up. So this is what I will do. Now, if you go to Otto class, if you had gone it th to this week, so let me see. <coughs> okay, so this is where you will be having your pre reports. Just click on this link. If you click on there, you, you will be able to write your pre report, your questions, etc. So I will, I will be able to read them. I mean, the reason why I put it on the weekend is that if it happens that I have some time on the weekend, I will read it on the weekend. So I will be ready before coming to the lecture. Now, the other thing is this one over here. <coughs> so I will just copy this to every week. So if you want a recitation, if five students tell me that they want a recitation that week, I will come at 8.40 for the recitation in the assigned lecture hall. Okay. So if you want a recitation, just go to there. Well, this is me. So <coughs> so as a student, if you want a recitation, there's the yes or no. If there are more, at least five students, five or more, there will be a recitation that we, if there are not less than five students, there won't be a recitation that week. My office hours, I usually don't put office hours. Uh, you can just come to my office whenever you can find me in my office. Uh, but anyway, if we don't have a recitation for that week, I will be in my office. So you can just come to my office and ask your questions there. Since I'm already taking my daughter to the school at eight in the morning, in met on campus, I will, I'm in the department at 8.20. But I just don't want to come to the class to wait for you in an empty classroom.
Okay, any other questions? Are you sure? Okay, so let's begin. <coughs> Now, just keep in mind, all these slides I will be uh, uploading in AutoCAD. I'm also recording my sound, so you will be able to also listen to the, watch the display. I'm recording my uh, display. You can watch it and listen to me lecturing, and also go over the slide in PDF form. So if you are not, if you don't like taking notes, you don't have to take notes. I, when I was a student, I used to like taking notes because in every lecture that I don't take notes, I used to go to sleep. So it's up to you. So what's the vector? And I want participation, not just coming to the class, sitting in the back and listening passively. What's the vector? The line that the line which have direction and length. A line. Straight line. Okay. Let's say kind of yes. A vector is something that has a direction and a magnitude. Then of course the question is what's the direction? How do we show it? How do we show a vector? Well in real life we can say, okay, this five meters in that direction, that's a, that's a vector. So we know the direction. And we know the magnitude. So that's, that defines a vector. So if you want to define a vector, you have to make sure that somebody, some other, but somebody else who reads it, who sees your definition, knows what is the direction, what is the magnitude. Now we usually will, what we will be doing is we will just take some coordinate axis and let's say if this is our vector, it can be a position vector, it can be the velocity vector. In, our, in this course, it will be the electric field vector, the magnetic field vector, the current vector, etc. So you can just draw some perpendicular lines to the xy plane. Let's say this is perpendicular to the xy plane. And then draw a perpendicular to the z axis. So this is, let's say, this is our vector A. This is A, Z. Uh, at, from this point, you can draw a perpendicular, horizontal to Y, perpendicular to X and perpendicular to Y. This is A, Y, this is A, X. So of course, I mean, just telling what A, X, A, Y, and A, Z is will not tell anybody what your vector is. You are missing one information if you just tell me what AX, AY, and AZ are. You have to specify also the coordinate axis. In a given coordinate axis, once you define your coordinate axis, then just knowing what AX, AY, and AZ are, then you know what the vector is. So we can write, we say that this, the A vector written in terms of its components is this one. Now here we are still using some vectors. X hat vector, for example, is this vector. Remember, we are defining an, the X hat vector, so we have to say its magnitude and its direction. X hat vector is a vector of whose magnitude is one, with no unit, and it points in the positive its direction. So we specify both its direction and the magnitude. Similarly for the Y hat vector, it points in the positive Y direction and has unit magnitude, and the z hat vector is pointing in the z direction and has unit magnitude. Now, of course, this is just one way of showing it. I can also show the same vector a this way. This is also valid. 
in this case, of course, I have to define the, what the r hat vector is. r hat vector, I define it to be the vector, the unit vector, unit length, pointing in the direction of a. <coughs> this is my r hat vector, or whichever definition you want. It's just up to you. It doesn't make any difference. Now, of course, with the vectors, we do many operations. I mean, we just multiply them with numbers. A times A. Now, let me just name them. Uh, if the, the, your definition is not familiar, is not so clear, if you have a question, you just ask me to repeat them. So, multiplication by a number. Is it clear what this? Adding two vectors. Well, the subtraction is also just a combination of the other two. Scalar product of two vectors. Theta being the angle between those two vectors, so if we have Let's say this is a vector, this is b vector, this is the angle theta between the two. Now, for example, since we have this definition, let's say a, we can also write it as a dot x hat in the x hat direction plus a dot y hat in the y hat direction plus a dot z hat in the z hat direction. So this is one nice thing about the scalar product. So if you choose the coordinate axis, uh, the scalar product tells you how to find the various components in these coordinate axes. Now the scalar product is also nice in determining how a vector changes if you rotate your coordinates. You see, one thing is the vectors, the, the vector as a mathematical object it just exists even if you don't choose a coordinate axis. You choose a coordinate axis only if you want to show its components explicitly. But whether you choose a coordinate axis or not, a vector exists. When I said that, okay, five meters in that direction, I didn't choose a coordinate axis. But if I want to talk about the x, y, and z components, then I have to choose the coordinate axis. And these x, y, and z components, they are arbitrary, vector, arbitrary coordinates. And this vector should still be the same whether I choose my x-axis in that direction or x-axis in that direction. But that kind of tells me that the x component of this vector, if I choose my x-axis in this direction, and the x component, if I choose my x-axis uh, in that direction, the components will be different, but nevertheless they should be related because they are related to the same vector that is independent of the vectors. Now let's use the scalar product to find the components of the vectors. So just for simplicity, let me just choose the, draw two dimensions. This is my vector A. And then I can choose a different coordinate axis. Then this can be some other coordinate axis. Let's say this is x prime, this is the y prime axis. And then I can write my vector a as, let's say, ax in the x hat direction plus a y in the y hat direction. Or I can write the same vector a as ax prime in the x prime hat direction plus a y prime in the y prime hat direction ax prime is the x coordinate in this rotated coordinate axis, ax is the x coordinate in the unrotated coordinate axis. Well, we know the properties of the scalar product. ax prime is nothing but the vector a, scalar product with x prime hat. But this a vector, I can also write it in this form, exactly the same form. So this will be equal to 
ax in the x hat plus ay in the y hat, scalar product x hat prime, which is ax x hat dot x hat prime plus ay y hat dot x hat prime. So let's say that these two coordinate axes, they are related by a rotation by theta. Now, what is x dot x hat prime? Remember, this is my x hat vector. This is my x hat prime vector. Now, the scalar product of any two vectors is equal to the product of their magnitudes, which is one, both of them are unit vectors, times cosine of the angle between the two. Let's see, y hat dot x hat prime Well, that's not y is 0. Let's not jump steps. I mean, it might be tedious or it might be obvious. Let's do it step by step. Well, it's the product of their norms is just 1 times the angle between the two. Now, y hat vector is this one. So it is cosine. Now, the angle between this vector and this vector, you see the whole angle is 90 degrees, theta degrees is over here, so the remaining, this angle over here is pi over 2 minus theta. So this just gives me, this is equal to sine of theta. So we already have ax prime is equal to ax cosine theta plus ay sine theta. Well, you can do the same thing for ay. ay prime is equal to minus ax sine theta plus ay cosine theta. Or let's say we have this <coughs> matrix. You had already taken 260, right? So this is equal to cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, ax, ay. So basically, you have this matrix over here. Let's just denote it by R. This is what's called a rotation matrix. So it takes one vector, or the components of the vector in one coordinate axis, and maps it into the components of the vector, of the same vector, in the rotated axis. Well, interestingly enough, you could have done something else. You could have kept the x hat and the y hat vectors constant. Don't change your coordinate axis. But take your vector a and rotate it by minus theta. So basically, this rotation of this coordinate axis, what it did was this vector a now makes theta, theta radians less with the, x axis, with the new x-axis. But you could have obtained the same effect by just rotating the a vector, by rotating the a vector by minus theta. So again, it will be exactly the same vector a, r. So this R vector, in a sense, you can treat it either as rotating your coordinate axis by theta or rotating your vector by minus theta. Do you remember what is the direction of this rotation? So let's say you are rotating the coordinate axis from x, y to x prime, y prime. What is the direction of the rotation vector? You are rotating the coordinate axis this direction. Hmm? So is everybody, does everybody agree that the rotation, well, you are rotating the vector A by minus theta around this axis, or you are rotating the vector A by theta around this axis. 
Or you can say you are rotating the coordinates by theta again around this axis. So is it clear on, do you remember how we find this direction of rotation? Just the right hand rule, take your right hand and curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation, your thumb is the axis of rotation. And that basically brings us to the cross product of vectors for A cross B. Well, this is a vector, a scalar product. If you look at the scalar product, as the name implies, this is a number, this is a number, this is just a number. The scalar product of two vectors is a number or a scalar. A vector product, if you take a vector and take the cross product with another vector, it gives you a vector. Well, since it's a vector, it should have both a direction and a magnitude. So if we are defining this operation of taking the cross product of two vectors or the vector product of two vectors, we have to say what will be the direction of the resultant vector and what will be the magnitude of the resultant vector. So those two inform information we have to define. Now let's start with the magnitude. What is the magnitude of A cross B? The magnitude of A, the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between the two and the direction, well, let's say if this is our vector A, this is our vector B, and this is theta. But you see, the cross product, when we are talking about the cross product, we are not talking about the direction. It's just the first one multiplied by the second one. So whichever direction you choose in your terminology, we should get the same vector. Let me also do this one. I take the same one. So you were saying that it should be into the class, into the screen, right? <coughs> this one. Yes, yes, yes. It should be into the screen. Let's look at this one with your argument if we, I take the angle like this. Should be opposite. But which one? I mean, we cannot allow such an ambiguity. The definition of the cross product is unique. There's no ambiguity in the definition. What's going on? Okay, I can go from A to B like this, or also like this. Hmm? Why? <laughs> it's the correct answer, but why? I mean, in fact, both of them are correct. Right. Yep, that's one. You see, this is one point that you have to pay attention to. Here, although we are talking about the norm, which the magnitude, which is supposed to be a positive number. If you take this angle, sine of this angle over here is negative. So this is negative. So you are right in a sense, it is pointing in this direction, but its component is negative. And so it's pointing in this direction, even if you choose this angle. Whether you choose this angle or this angle, it is always pointing out of the screen. So it doesn't really matter I mean, which angle you choose, whether the smaller one or the larger one, it doesn't matter. The result is the same. So it, you will be wiser to choose the smaller one because there are no technical complications then. But both of them, if done properly, they give you the same answer. And the cross product, x cross y, what's the direction of x cross y? Well, I don't know. I didn't define the z-axis yet. 
Well, you see, given x and y directions, there are two choices perpendicular to that one. I can choose the z axis to be, or the z hat to be in this direction. This is what's called a right-handed reference coordinate axis. Or I can define x cross y hat to be minus z hat. This is the left-handed coordinate system. Well, both are valid. You can use both of them. The only important thing is that you have to be consistent. And also to be consistent with the literature, we will be using the right-handed coordinate system. We will not be using the left-handed coordinate system. You will never see anywhere the left-handed system being used. We will always stick with the right-handed coordinate system. In this coordinate system, x cross y hat is z hat. There is no minus sign. And this, if this is, uh, let me, if these are our axis x, y, so this is the z. This is our coordinate axis. So x cross y is the z hat, y cross z x and z cross x Why? Well, they kind of look cyclic. If you go in this order, x, y, z, x cross y gives you z, y cross z gives you x, z cross x gives you y. No signs. If you go the other way around, there, is, there will be a sign change. So x, y cross x, well, there will be a sign change, mainly because a cross b is equal to minus b cross a. <coughs> For the scalar product, if you change the order, nothing changes. But for the vector product, if you change the order, the sign changes. Then, of course, you have all these operations. You can just combine them. For example, you have two vectors. If you take a third vector, you can just uh, take the scalar product. Well, this will be equal to b cross c dot a, which will be equal to c cross a. That B. Again, if you just keep the cyclic order A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, in all these terms, there are no sign changes. Have you seen index notation in 209 or 2010? Okay. And finally, A cross B cross C. Well, probably this year, I mean, you will not be able to remember it, but after you, after you write it, let's say, or drive it hundreds of times, then you will, you will remember that this is b times a dot c minus a dot b dot c. Now, of course, the interesting thing is how to derive it. Now, what you can do is if you want to equate two vectors, you can just calculate the x component of this one, show that it is equal to the x component of this one, do the same for the y and the same for the z components. Well, there's a shorter way if you are familiar with the index notation. If you are not, I strongly suggest you to, if you forget, forgot it, I strongly suggest you to review it. Let's look at the i component of this one. I can be x, y, or z, I don't know. 
So what is, for any two vectors, if you take the cross product, do you remember what the I component is? How can we write it? I mean, now we will come back to this one, but if you have two vectors, you are taking the cross product. We know that it's a vector, so it has three components in three dimensions. What is the ith component? How can we write it in index notation? A, J, B, K. Hmm? Does it sound familiar? Do you remember it? No? Now, we will not be using this often. <coughs> but, I mean, if you don't use it, you will have to learn how to remember these. In the exam, I will be giving you all these vector equations. I mean, you don't have to memorize it in the exam, but while you are working, you will need to remember what these uh, identities are. But if, once, if you get familiar with index notation, you can actually draw it in just a couple of lines. So just before going to the break, let me just demonstrate how to drive it. Well, by the way, epsilon 1, 2, 3, or epsilon x, y, z, this is equal to 1. This is equal to epsilon 2, 3, 1. This is equal to epsilon 3, 1, 2. And epsilon i, j, k is equal to minus epsilon j, i, k, et cetera. If we just change any indices, it changes sign. And epsilon 1, 2, 3 is just 1. Now let's look at this one. This is equal to, as your friend has pointed out, the i component of a cross product is epsilon i, j, k. multiplied with the j component of this first vector over here. In this case, it is a cross b. And the k component of the second vector, in this case, it is c. Now, again, we have a cross product over here. And that cross product, the j component, will be epsilon j. Well, here I'm summing over j and k. Here I will be have other indices which I will be summing, but these indices and these indices will be independent. So let me just give them some different <coughs> names. J, L, M, A, L, B, M, C, K. Well, I'm kind of used to having the same index at the same position. So let me just switch the j and i. Now here I have the products of these two things. And that with the same indices are equal. So this i, k, either i should be equal to l and k should be equal to m for this thing to be non-zero, or i should be equal to m and k should be equal to l. Minus Kronecker delta i, l, Kronecker delta k, m, minus Kronecker delta i, m, k, l. This Kronecker delta, are you familiar with this one? It is just one if these two indices are the same, or it is zero if they are different. So this product of so-called Levi-Civita tensors, I mean, since each one of them is one minus one or zero, their product is either one minus one or zero. In this case, it is one. In this case, it is minus one. In other, all other cases, it should be zero. And then we just multiply. 
well, I'm summing over L. Remember, A L multiplied with this one. I'm summing over L. And only the term L is equal to I is non-zero. All other terms are zero because of this Kronecker delta. So that is minus A I. I'm summing over K and M. So it just tells me that when I'm summing over K and M, only terms for which K is equal to M survive, and I'm summing over all of them. But that just means I'm just multiplying the corresponding components of these two vectors, the x components together, the y components together, the z components together, and then summing them up. But that is the definition of the scalar product. Plus, uh, plus because I have a minus over here, another minus over here, that makes a plus. Now I have this one. I'm multiplying bm with this one. Again, only the m is equal to i term survives, bi. And here I have the chronicler delta KL, ALCK. Only the K is equal to L terms survive in this sum. And if I just sum over all those terms, I just get the scalar product of A and C. But this is nothing but, well, let, this is not the vector, B A dot C minus A B dot C. This is a vector, and uh, it is the ith component of this vector. So A cross B cross C, we know that this is a vector whose ith component is equal to the ith component of this vector. So the x component of this one is equal to the x component of this one. The y component of this one is equal to the y component of this one. And the z components of both sides are equal. Well, if I have two vectors whose components are equal, whose all the components are equal, and remember, the components specify a vector uniquely. If you know the components, you know the vector. And these two vectors have the same components, so they have to be the same vector. Well, these are all the things that we will be using throughout the semester about the vectors themselves. And any questions? Then we can, <laughs> yes. You call them Shigeria, right? Huh. Sure, sure. Right. Well, you see, you can look at it as this matrix as the rotation by theta of your axis. For example, if you just rotate your axis here, what we had done was, if you rotate the axis, then the components of the vectors transform according to this matrix R. So if you just form a column, row, column matrix whose entries are the, your components <coughs> in the unrotated coordinate axis, multiply it with this matrix, then you will get a new column matrix whose components are the components of the same vector in the rotated coordinate axis. Or we had also said that if you look at, if you take your vector without touching your coordinate <coughs> axis, you rotate your vector by minus theta around the same axis. Again, this is the components of your vector before it's rotated. And these are the components of your vector after it is rotated. And this R matrix just gives a relation. It rotates, in a sense, the components of your vector. And again, this one in index notation, we also we can all, we could have written it as the i component, i a i prime is equal to r i j, a j. In index notation, so here there is a summation over the j, which we are not writing explicitly. Well, it is basically this equation over here. 
you see here what we did, if you take, for example, i to be the first component or the x component, this is ax prime is equal to ax multiplied by some number, which turns out to be cosine theta. So rx x is cosine theta, or r11 is cosine theta, r11, plus r12 times ay. Ay is this one, r12 is the sine theta, or this is r12. So this is just a shorthand way of writing these two equations or this matrix equation over here. Okay, a 10 minute break, and then we will continue with uh, derivatives. <laughs>